Okay, everybody, welcome to Atlanta Startup Village number 48. I know, there you go, right? Oh, that got quiet real fast. Thank you. Okay, so on that note, the first thing I want to say is if you are in the back having what you think is a very quiet conversation, that is a lie. We can hear you. Please don't do that because these presenters have worked really hard to prep and it's kind of rude. And if I hear you, I will tell you to go out to the lobby or the angry pregnant lady in the back will also tell you to go out to the lobby and you don't want to mess with her. So if you have something really cool to say to somebody else, either wait till after or take it. And when I say lobby, I mean all the way out the double doors next to the actual front desk. We can still hear you in the beer room. All right, I am Allie. I am the MC of Startup Village, in case you didn't notice. Um, I have a couple of housekeeping things tonight, aside from the fact that we can hear you. The first is this is being live streamed by this lovely gentleman here in the back. He is with PulseSpark. Give them a round of applause for live streaming us every single time. All right, and then we have two fantastic sponsors who have sponsored us for the beer. So let's first give a round of applause to Max with Digital Crafts. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, we've been here uh, for about a year and a half now, so some of you might have seen us before. But if this is your first time here, you're in for a good night. Uh, so we are a coding boot camp or an accelerated learning program, Digital Crafts. We have a headquarters here in, on the fifth floor of ATV. We also have a campus in Houston. Um, so basically, we teach beginners how to program. So we train full stack web developers in a 16-week full-time program and a 24-week part-time program for working professionals. So our full-time program, the next one starts September 5th because we just kicked a new one off. Uh, the next part-time program starts on July 11th, so it's right around the corner. If you've ever thought about learning how to code or if you have a friend or nephew or aunt who might want to uh, learn how to cut, send them our way. Um, let's see, we've got folks working at Turner Broadcasting, ADP, New York Times, uh, we, Big Nerd Ranch, I don't know, a lot of, lot of companies, mostly local, um, but I think that's probably my time, so give us a shout if you want to learn anything more, and have a good night. Right. And our second beer sponsor is Alex with Algolia. You guys really have a beer drinking problem, I, I think, when you need two sponsors. Uh, I only have one minute, and that's not entirely enough time to explain what we do, but I'm going to keep it super short and simple and just talk about why we're here. So we're a search engine API. And what that means is we built an API that makes it easier for you to build search into your website, your mobile app, your software, and not have to maintain it, because building search is a real pain. Um, and building instant search that's very relevant is even worse. So we're working with websites like Twitch, uh, with apps like Periscope, which is a live streaming app from Twitter, um, the LVMH brand, which is Louis Vuitton, uh, Moet Chandon, et cetera. And we're helping them build a much better search for their users to uh, interact with. Um, we're a company from Paris. I do not have a French accent. Uh, I'm from Atlanta, and I've been living out in Paris for a few years. And by the greatest customers that you could ever imagine have allowed us to raise a $53 million Series B and has allowed us to uh, move to Atlanta and open up an office. So you're looking for a job, any role, we'd be happy to talk with you. Uh, we have an incredible culture, an incredible team, and truly an incredible product. And we'd be happy to talk to you. We all have the Algolia shirts and we're hanging out in the back. So thank you guys so much. Enjoy the beer and enjoy the pitches. Thank you. All right, and if you guys want to follow along on the conversation in social media, it is hashtag ATLSV. We've got the Instagram and the Twitter handles up there. Tag some of these fantastic presenters tonight. And we are going to kick it off with Atlas Bay VR. Thank you very much, Ali. Appreciate it. Well, I don't need two mics, but he might. Just one talk. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. My name's Cameron Apt, and this is my partner, Adam Chichilla, and we're the founders of Atlas Bay VR. Now, uh, what we do is actually... Uh, bring your space to life. Um, what, our our main, main focus right now is actually um, supposed to, to be for um, uh, companies who want to design, market, or sell real estate. That's really what we do. And, um, excuse me for a second. 
what, what we majorly focus on is, is two aspects of that. A lot of customers really don't know how to design their, uh, their real estate. And, uh, and some of the customers don't really know how to sell their, their real estate. Um, so uh, the, the majority of what we, we focus on is being able to use virtual reality in helping them with this. We, we focus in, in two main areas. Uh, one is the architectural reviews, where people have a hard time understanding 2D floor plans and drawings. Uh, back when Adam and I worked as engineers for a defense contractor, we were uh, responsible for using virtual reality to help design some of our products in our factories. And we realized that most people have a hard time understanding uh, 2D floor plans and, and drawings. So uh, we realized that the real estate industry has the same issue. We come in by working directly with the developer and the architect very closely to help identify um, areas where they want to create virtual experiences for their sales team. Um, uh, the, the two things that we mainly do is um, go through where they're having an issue with design. For instance, we were uh, working with a developer that wanted to uh, do an amenity space that included a library. Now, their library, they thought, was big enough. But by looking at the drawings, everybody agreed on that. Uh, when they actually got into it in VR, they realized that uh, the space was too small. It's immediately obvious when you're in a physical space. So when you're in that space uh, and they realize it was too small, they can actually make that change before they build anything. And that saves them a lot of time and money. The second thing we do is later in the process, we create a customer-facing high-end sales tool for their sales staff. We create the content. We build the hardware, we install it in their, uh, uh, their leasing office, and then we train their sales staff. And this is what that experience looks like. You'll see on the left here, we've got uh, the person in the headset, and on the right is what they're seeing. You can physically walk through the entire space as if you were actually there. We can also take the virtual objects, like this couch, and map them into reality so you can physically sit down. This is a golf simulator for something that, uh, for one of our customers. And we figured that it would be fun to do virtual golf in virtual reality. So uh, <laughs> you'll have to forgive our, um, our actor over here because he's a lefty and we made him swing righty for this video. <laughs> now we, we focus, we, we talk to the developers and we try to figure out what, what are their selling points? What are the main things that they focus on? Is it the, um, uh, the golf simulator? Is it the yoga studio or is it the, resort style pool with the cabana. This right here is an apartment building. And what we do is we, we add and we include things that you can customize. For instance, wall colors, uh, flooring, things like furniture. And that's great for condo developers who really want to have their clients invest in what they're going to be building. But this specific instance was a 25 story um, high rise. So we went out to the 8th, 16th, and 24th floors to take actual pictures of where they're from, uh, what the views are like. So they can actually change the floor views and see what they're actually going to be seeing. This is downtown Nashville. So this is the experience that you're going to get if you end up in the leasing office. But not everybody can make it to the leasing office. So as a byproduct of creating this, we can also create a lot of other content, including things like uh, renderings, where people already have a budget to create this. We also include things like 360 degree video. And that's something that's, that's super easy to use, usually gets more views, and can be posted on something like YouTube, like you're seeing here, or Facebook. Now, I'm sure all you guys are familiar with something like uh, Google Street View. And we create a similar experience that's a point-to-point -point web based virtual tour where the customer can actually take this, put it on their website, and now anybody can take a virtual tour of their space. All right, so uh, we've been in business for about a year, and um, we're looking forward to the future. All right, now we got questions. All right, who has questions? All right, we got one in the back. How much, does, how much does this add to the developer's cost? Um, it's not insignificant. So our projects usually run from 
five to about fifty thousand dollars and most of that is because we have to create the content from scratch go to the, um, the back screen um, it adds a little bit to their budget and which is the, one of the reasons why we need to get in early so that they can budget for something like this they usually comes out of the marketing budget um, which is usually six, nine, 12 months already something that they've thought about and um, allocated. Does that answer your question? Great. Any other questions? Right here. Can we build a simulation from an existing Revit model? Can we build a from an existing Revit model? Um, yes, a lot of times, especially for the upfront design reviews, that's exactly what we do because we want it to be low cost and iterative. So we take the Revit model or any BIM CAD information that we have and we create the model so that people can look through it and find out exactly what the flaws are. Is this too big? Is this too small? But for the, uh, the customer facing version, a lot of times what we do is start with the BIM model and then uh, really create something that's, that's sales ready, customer facing, textures, materials, et cetera. Did that answer your question? Great. All right, who else we got? Over here. Average turnaround time for a project. That can be between uh, three and 12 months, really depending on the size of the project. Um, like we said, we have to create a lot of the content. And most of the stuff we've done in-house between the two of us, about 90% of it. So we've started in our growth strategy to be able to try and outsource that. Um, and that's what we're really look, looking forward to do. Yeah, three 12 weeks, did I say that? Oh, months, sorry, I'm sorry, three 12 weeks, I'm sorry. Thank you. All right, over here. Great question. Is there any reason why we wouldn't allow somebody to do this remotely if they have hardware themselves, right? Is that your question? Um, you, we usually have the hardware built with a really high specification. If anybody knows about VR equipment, we use a 1080 Ti and a Core i7-7700 processor. And that's something that not a lot of people normally have. Uh, we build it like that so that the cost is lower. We don't optimize as much as um, uh, a lot of people. And so we don't really release it for that reason. But in the future, when the workflow improves, that's something that we would love to do as this technology increases in mass adoption. All right, who else has questions? Over here. Sure, ideal customer. Um, really anybody who's developing anything, uh, the, especially in, the, cons in, in the, um, the commercial market, I should say, because the consumer market right now, the ROI really isn't there for a small customer who's just building a house, I wanna see it. But for if you're building cookie cutter homes or if you're building large developments like a $100 million um, high rise or something like that, that's, that's really our ideal customer. Um, it can vary in size between, you know, a garden style 200 apartment unit complex or an office building that's going to hold uh, that, that's 40, 40 stories. So ideal customer is kind of hard, but not small residential space builders. All right. Any other questions? Sure. What did we bring to the table that competitors in the space might not have? Um, we only are understand a, a few different competitors. There's, there's not a ton that are doing specifically real estate, but there are a ton of companies that are doing VR because it's a big buzzword and everybody wants to get involved, right? Um, so being from the industry, uh, we actually were able to get in way before stuff came out in the consumer world. We were working with hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars worth of VR equipment um, AR equipment, motion capture equipment at our defense uh, roles, and that's what we really brought to the table. We, we brought the knowledge base, we understood what the workflow is like, and then we're trying to bring that into the real estate market using the consumer hardware that is much easier to afford. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. All right, well, we only got 10 seconds left, so I'm gonna say, if you guys have any other questions, feel free to email us, and uh, thank you all for your time, appreciate it. Awesome. So as those of you who have been here before know, we also do this really cool thing between pitches called volunteer pitches. So if you volunteer to set up and take down this enormous amount of chairs, you get 30 seconds between the pitches. So my number one pitcher here, Adam, I'm going to say your last name wrong, Abramowitz. Hey, guys.
We're developing an app for authentic self-expression, a humanistic environment of non-judgment where a user can explore themselves introspectively on a platform that provides and encourages real perspectives and real connections with other people. We've got full design schematics, high fidelity mockups, annotations, and features for an MVP release. We've got a business proposal for potential investors and a plan to engage the platform for monetization. We've got a target audience and plans for marketing and growth, but we don't have a technical co-founder. If you're an engineer and you're interested in working on something like this, please come speak with me. <laughs> After the meeting, I get, I get nervous up here, guys, sorry. <laughs> My name's Adam, thanks for letting me share. And one more volunteer in between the pitches, we have Andrew. <clears throat> All right, well, I think I had uh, one too many of those tropicalities, so I kind of forgot what I was going to say. Um, which is almost as tragic if, as if all of you forgot to do um, your marketing with BNT. Um, at BNT, we implement innovative and creative strategies to bridge the gap between uh, brands and their consumers. So I look forward to uh, talking to you guys after, and uh, thank you. Okay, we've got our next presenters up. Give it up for Chauffeur. Hello, everybody. My name is Arash Shirazi. I'm the Chief Technical Officer of Chauffeur. And my name is Merrick Levy. I'm the Chief Operating Officer. And we're an online platform for charter bus reservations. So people can go online and reserve a bus anywhere in the United States, Canada, and parts of the UK. We've been around since 2013. We were founded. Um, we were a bootstrap company. And we now have, uh, so I, I joined the company about a year and a half ago when we had three people. And we're now at 25. And we're based down the street. Um, so if you don't know what a charter bus is, uh, you can see behind me, uh, this is an actual bus on the road in Texas. It has our branding on it, and it holds 55 passengers. So the majority of our business is for 55 passenger vehicles, um, but we also run anything from 14 to 25 to 32 passenger vehicles as well. They have luxury amenities, Wi-Fi, power outlets, um, DVD players, flat screens. Um, so what makes us different than going to a normal bus company renting a bus? Um, first, you can book anywhere in North America through just one place. You can go online or call, um, and we can reserve a bus online in seconds. There's no limit on how many passengers if you need to travel. So for example, if you call a local bus coming in Atlanta, they may have three or four buses. Uh, they may be booked for that day. And uh, if you have 200 people traveling, there's no way they can provide service for you. So we can aggregate and pull different companies together and make the moves happen. We have 24-7 live support. There's always someone in our office to answer questions. Um, and provide real-time support for uh, any trip we have going on. We currently have about 1,000 bus companies on the platform. Um, there are 20,000 vehicles in our system. Uh, we have data on every single vehicle, their year, make, model, type of vehicle, amenities in the vehicle, um, and real-time availability data on every vehicle. So we know in any market in the US um, what vehicles are available, and can price uh, any type of movement um, instantly online. Uh, we also have extensive quality screening. We know the vehicles. We've done thousands of trips already uh, throughout the three years we've been in business. So we have data on every company, if they're late, if they're early, um, how you know, uh, well-trained their drivers are, and how long they've been in business. Um, I'm going to pass on to Arash to talk a little bit about our clients and then some of the new technology we have coming out. Uh, so in addition to the regular bus rentals we do with um, everybody, whether it's like a wedding or a prom, uh, we really shine with either last minute or really big reservations. Uh, so for example, we've done a lot of distress situations with airlines where last second their uh, airplanes can't go off. So you know they're going to have to either go to a hotel or another um, place to fly. So we are able to gather any number of buses for however many uh, passengers they need to board uh, and take them where they need to go. Uh, we also do a lot with disaster relief. So when Hurricane Matthew hit, we were able to transport thousands of people uh, from the East Coast to safety and then back when it was okay to go back. Uh, we also do a lot of large scale events. So we deal with Fortune 500 companies, festivals, uh, to transport people to and from uh, their events. 
Uh, so one thing we're really excited to do this summer is revamp our application. So we're now going to uh, share our technology with our customers. So now customers are able to track their bus, get notifications, contact drivers on real time, um, and just streamline the whole process. Right now, there's not really you know, that much technology in the bus industry. If somebody needs to contact the driver because they don't know where they are, they have to call the bus company, and the bus company has to call the driver, and it gets really messy. Uh, and another place where this can really help uh, with is with large events. So if they're doing some sort of shuttle service, anybody attending this event can just go onto the app, track where the bus is exactly, see what the ETAs are, and know exactly when they need to be at the stop. It's also uh, particularly good for event organizers. Um, they're able to see a dashboard where every vehicle is at any given time um, and make sure all their operations go smoothly. Yep. Uh, so here's an example of some screenshots of what we do with uh, one of our clients. Uh, so you essentially just give any one of your people who are riding the bus a reservation code. They can put that into the app so you don't need thousands of people to you know, create an account. So they just put in the reservation code. They can view the bus stop, see where it is, uh, and just see where the bus is in that ETA. Uh, so we are a rapidly growing company. We are constantly looking to expand our team. Uh, so if you are looking to get into web development, uh, marketing, or sales, uh, feel free to contact me and uh, include your resume at arash at chauffeur.com, and we'd be happy to have you. Thanks. Right, any questions? Yeah, so there will be a link, that, so you can access, oh, so the question was, do I have to download the app, can I just uh, access it somewhere from the web? Uh, the answer is yes, you will have a link with a special URL that you can go onto from your app, or from your phone, or desktop, and you can track the bus there. So you have to rent the entire vehicle. Uh, the question was whether you can buy a ticket and the answer is no, you have to rent an entire vehicle. Yep. So you aren't reserving a seat on the bus, you're just renting a whole bus. So the question is, uh, is it aggregation or do we own assets? We do not own any buses, so it's aggregation. Um, the one you saw there is uh, with select providers on select buses, we have marketing arrangements with them, so they wrap all their vehicles. There are about 60 vehicles wrapped in the US right now. Uh, the question was, what is our biggest challenge in the space? Um, I would say adoption of new technology um, for a lot of the bus companies. They're very, very antiquated, um, and introducing any new technology is a challenge. Yeah, I was, I was going to say the same thing. Some of these bus companies will have their reservations on pencil and paper, so the struggle is making sure you know they come up to speed. So the question was how you regulate quality. Um, so we have a lot of data on every bus, the year. Um, we keep close records of any complaints on each bus company. Um, we have information about their drivers, how well they're trained, how late buses have been in the past, especially when we track them. Um, so we have a lot of data that helps us with that. So the question is, why buses? Uh, so our founder, who's not here at the moment, he actually, uh, his uncle owned the bus company. Um, so he was working in the bus industry before he started this, and he realized how bad a job everyone was doing at the time. So the question is how we determine pricing. So it's a good question. So uh, we have availability data, so we know where uh, more or less buses are utilized and when they're not utilized. So for example, um, if you're in um, Birmingham, Alabama, there's only about five or six bus companies and they may be sold out, right? So clients can call them and they won't be able to reserve a bus. We can bring buses from anywhere in the country um, to them and they'll just pay deadhead. Deadhead's an industry term for getting the bus there and back empty from a nearby city. So the question is what tracking devices we use and if we have tracking in all 20,000 vehicles. So we have some proprietary technology for um, many of our buses. 
there are some that either have just signed up and are still onboarding, or their buses just can't support the technology. Um, but for the most part, we support a good amount. So for GPS tracking, it's on a project by project basis, and the drivers have an app, and we can track them through the app that way. Um, so, uh, the question is if we thought about licensing to the public school buses. Um, it's a good idea. Uh, you know, the margins are a lot lower in school buses and they're locked into large contracts with a lot of the uh, school dish public school districts. We've done transportation for some private schools. They need Mercedes, sorry? <laughs> it's fine. There's some uh, private schools we do a lot of business with. So the question is, um, do the partners go through us for support? So can you be more specific what you mean by support? They, they, they would contact us. Sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, so the question was, what type of developers? So uh, we have a web-based platform, so uh, we're looking for front-end developers as well as back-end um, who are particularly um, involved in Python. Uh, we have about seven seconds, so we have one more question. So the question is with 25 employees, how we have 24-7 support. Um, so a large part of our team are sales, uh, so we have someone there uh, in our office 24-7 every day of the week. Thank you. All right, up next on our volunteers, we have Sinar and Alexis. You're going to have to share one Woo. mic. That's fine. Who here hates doing laundry? Yes. And want somebody to shop their groceries from any store? And maybe even walk their dog after work so that they don't miss happy hour. Or rush to get back here like I do. Okay. I'm Sonara and this is Alexis and we're co-founders for Go Getter. We're an on-demand personal errand service where you can have insured, professional, and verified Go Getters help you with your everyday errands seven days a week. We need your help to try out the new user experience that we have on our platform. Visit gogetter.com and use code ATLSV, of course, and you'll get $5 off your errand. And we'll be in the back after pitches if anybody wants to chat. I have down a name on the list, but I don't see another volunteer. But I have up next uh, Nia or Nia Moore. Ah, she's in the back. Come on down. Hey, how y'all doing? I just want to ask, when was the last time you had fun at work? I'll wait. <laughs> You're lying. Um, whether you did or didn't, I've got just the service for you. Um, research suggests that happy employees are the best employees. And Comedy Break is an on-demand comedy service where we provide the laughs and you provide the space. We are willing to bring some of the hottest comics in and around the country to your office, and we're looking to do comedy breaks in increments of 10, 20, 30 or more minutes right to you, and you can go back to work happy. <laughs> At least for that day. <laughs> if you have any, any more questions or anything like that, you can send an email to comedybreaknow at gmail.com or visit www.comedybreak.wordpress.com. Don't laugh, wordpress.com site still rule. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Up next, we have Gate. Take it away, Frank. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Frank Ni, and uh, it started two years ago when I was watching a PBS TV. Uh, the show is called The Rise of Hackers. Um, I'm a Java programmer, and I've been programming for many years, and the problem in the show, it says password is a great problem, great threat to our current digital system, cybersecurity. So I was thinking maybe I can come up with a solution to solve the problem. 
like usually it's like your password is lowercase, uppercase, uh, too short, too long, this and that, com combination of mixed different characters. What a headache. And also, to the mic. also that uh, even if you have a correct good strength password, people can um, steal your password by key logging uh, or um, like a video uh, shooting or peeking over the shoulder. So there's a bunch of problems. It's, uh, it's been a long time the, the password system has been using for thousands of years, like open sesame. So I think in this digital time, we should use our digital technology, not technology to change this fundamental security problem. And I do need two volunteers. One more? Okay. Uh, the volunteers will try to steal my password in the new system. I came up, yeah, I came up with a solution because I found the problem is it's too obvious. When you type in A, B, C, and he look at it, look at the keyboard, he can steal it. If he has a uh, key logger or uh, a video camera, peeking over the shoulder when you type it in, they can steal it, right? So it's very dangerous. And the solution to this is, the way I thought of it, is to enter a group of symbols at the same time for one ping, and then the second ping, another group of symbols. So when he look at it, he doesn't know which one is my ping inside this group. And this group is called a token. I call it a token. So give me uh, just one second. I'll show you an example here. Come over here. You try to steal my password, okay? okay. Yeah. And when I enter it, I'm just <laughs> pretending, the pretending these are the hackers try to intercept my information. I enter here my user ID, and the server gets my user ID and presented me with all those tokens. There are 16 tokens, four by four. And now I'm entering my password. Successful. Okay. So now, I'll let you try. <laughs> <laughs> you saw it, right? I you you even recorded, phone, yes. But there's too many it doesn't matter. combinations. Yes, that's the trick. So I guess if you recognize all the symbols in each combination, you'll know what the answer is. And the trick is, my pin may or may not appear. So. That's 15, R, umbrella. Oh, hang on. I have 15 R umbrella. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so yeah, yeah. You can combine those 15. two. 15. <laughs> that R. Ah, oh, shit. That one. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess it was a P. It's not there. All right. So the trick <laughs> is sometimes it may not appear, but definitely at least one pin. I have four pins. You saw that. At least one pin should be in this table. So the server, when I enter those tokens, the server looks into my password in the record and checks the system that you enter. If a pin appears and you did not enter, it's wrong. But if a, not, if a pin is not appearing, you can use a wildcard. That's a trick. So it just throws people off when you try to steal my password. Gotcha. Yes. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, here's a comparison of the new system to the old system. On the left side, there's open sesame, which is ob very obvious. You can see that password when people log in. On the right side is my new system. It's called a gate. Graphic access tabular entry. Each time, the token combination is different. The ping is still the same. So you don't have to change your ping, but the server gives you different combinations and just throw people off. My time is up. <laughs> so any questions? Uh, it's called a gate. And here's the information if uh, you want to go to the website. There's uh, three different videos. One is short for people who don't uh, have a lot of time, six minutes. And the longest one is about 20 minutes. It has some movie clips like uh, 007 try to steal people's passwords. <laughs> you go. Yeah. So is the problem you're trying to solve is someone looking over your shoulder? 
or key logging. Can we repeat the question, Frank? Yes, uh, the problem is, uh, is, am I trying to solve the problem of somebody trying to peek over my shoulder? Yes, it's one of the situations. The other situation is key logging. You don't know, you download a program, and it, it, it just stays on your computer when you try to log into other different systems. It just keeps your keystrokes. And also uh, wiretapping, FBI, whatever hackers doing that. And also uh, videotaping, uh, lots of different scenarios. Uh, I just uh, got a patent last Can year, you repeat so I'm the trying question? to organize it. How much did it cost? Okay. Sorry. Uh, so I'm just in the first stage of uh, trying to commercialize it, see any company would, willing to invest or commercialize, help me commercialize it. Uh, the question is, is this a product or idea? Uh, the idea has been turned into this product. It's called a gate. <laughs> yeah. So, so I can sell uh, software licensing or I can sell the sample software when people want it to use my uh, code as an example how to program this. I cannot hear your question. Oh, yeah, yeah. The question is, how do, you, do I prevent this from somebody else using this idea? It's been patented. I got a patent for this. Yes. Is an internet connection required? Is it server side or client side? Uh, uh, the question is, is it client side or server side? If you are using this on the mobile phone, uh, no, no server side. It's just your phone. But if you are logging into a banking system or like ATM, uh, yeah, ATM is quite dangerous when people look over your shoulder or whatever. So in the public, especially in the public area, or even if you sell, use a cell phone in the mall, somebody can video zoom in, so steal your password or your finger movements. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, the question is, can I give an example of the pin combination? Yes, exactly. For this example, I can, I can show you the pin that I had, <laughs> umbrella, whatever. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> yeah, I have one minute left. So for this example, um, Yeah, umbrella coming up again. Let's see. Uh, actually, it's like a sun. You see the sunshine? And umbrella and a plus sign and a minus sign. That's actually my pin. My pin is sun plus umbrella plus and a minus. It's mixed into all those symbols. It's very hard to see, right? Next time when I try to log in, the umbrella is gone. The sun is still there at the bottom, you see? The, if the umbrella is gone, I can use a wire card to replace that umbrella, and the plus sign is there, and the minus sign is there, you see? Oh, that's an equal sign. <laughs> no, 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 you can come back. If you do it wrong, you can come back and correct. You see the minus, plus minus? Still logging successful. Yeah, if I try something else, it might tell me wrong. Yeah, nowadays everybody like uh, very scared about cybersecurity, personal information. Uh, how do I see uh, it's being used, right? How big a problem this is? It's a very big problem, cybersecurity uh, issue. I think government is spending like trillions of dollars. And the, the, the cost when a company has passwords stolen is very high, like millions and millions. Specifically about this solves. Uh, um. I tell you what. Why don't we take that question <laughs> off uh, offline for after the uh, okay. after the meetup because we've got another presenter right. coming up. But great question. Thank you.
All right, up next in our volunteers, we have Brian Kramer. Brian Kramer, where are you? Come on up. Hello. Hey, if you could pick up the phone, call your attorney anytime you want, ask him any question you want, talk as long as you want, and not get an invoice, would you do it? Yeah, what's my number? With Legal Shield, we are disrupting how people acquire and pay for legal and business consulting services. So if you'd like to learn how you can protect yourself, protect your family, protect and grow your business, I'll be in the back of the room and I'll tell you more. All right, and next we have RethinkingStartups.com. On. Hello. <laughs> okay, first, uh, I need to start with an apology. Um, I've literally been working on my master plan for like the last three years, and somehow I started working on the presentation a few hours ago. Honestly, this presentation was going to be awesome, and now it's honestly, this isn't even a joke, it kind of got rushed together. Fact, most startups will fail. Fact, most startup pitch presentations involve live speaking. Correlation, causation, coincidence? Look, 99% of startup, look, 99% of startups will fail, but 100% of entrepreneurs believe they will be the 1% to succeed. Both of those stats have caused me a lot of angst and, uh, and thought over the years. That's kind of where RethinkingStartups.com came from. Hi. I'm Jeff, and I suck at many things, but I'm great at a few things, and I'm here pitching for partners who are great at the things that I suck at. So I really suck at presentations. This is going to be all over the place. Look, admittedly, I'm recording this like an hour before the presentation even starts. I could talk for hours about uh, all my thoughts and theories on startups and all the different projects that I'm looking for partners for, uh, but I should probably just keep going because I'm super ADD. I literally own the domain name, IamADD.com. Anyway, my background, my first startup uh, started as a joke. I created something called the Rejection Hotline. It was a funny fake phone number people could give out instead of their real number. Started getting millions of phone calls. It was basically, hello, this is not the person you were trying to call. You've reached the Rejection Hotline. The person who gave you this number didn't want you to have their real number. Millions of calls, super viral. That's how I started learning about virality. I've since created 40 plus viral ventures that have reached millions and millions of people. Created a national Get Over It Day, which was kind of a gag, but it, Good Morning America picked it up, The Today Show picked it up, ESPN Sports Center did a segment. Over the years, I've been around a lot of startups, successes, failures, and everything in between. But, but I've been observing and learning and questioning a lot of things. Every startup is different. Every entrepreneur is different. Look no further than you got Gary Vaynerchuk, who, who is all about hustle, grind, work 80 hour weeks. Then on the other side, you've got Tim Ferriss, who's all about the four hour work week, uh, work smarter rather than harder. Those guys are both super successful, have huge followings, and make really great points for some entrepreneurs and some types of startups. So part of the whole rethinking startups model is that we are going to shake things up and try to encourage people to consider what works for them. Starting a startup is very different than scaling a startup. I want to create the idea of starter startups, not to be any less than a real startup, but to be the first stage of a real startup. Starter startups can be started for a minimal amount of money with a minimal amount of time. And the goal is to get an MVP up that you can kind of test and see if you can get viral traction or product market fit or users or whatever. A starter startup, I feel like could be part time for a lot of people. If you're an expert at something and great at what you do, you're so much faster and better than somebody who's just trying to learn that stuff. So if you do digital marketing for a company, if you do uh, social media management, if you are a graphic designer for a startup, come work with us 10 hours a week, nights, weekends, whenever. And we've got a ton of stuff that you guys can jump on board with. You can read all about all my thoughts on startups and my rethinking startups uh, ideas for improvement and, and, and whatever at uh, startupwhatever.com. But uh, for now, yeah, you can look and see how many different concepts I have just for improving startups. Anybody wants to get involved in one of these? go right ahead. Anyway, my area of expertise is virality, and I think entrepreneurs need to figure out what they're great at. Startups are hard enough as it is. Don't do something you're not great at. Look, I'm not a good presenter, and I'm already halfway through the presentation. I haven't told you any of our stuff. My stuff started with the humor hotlines, the rejection hotline. We have all those audio assets ready to relaunch in other formats, MP3s, uh, premium hotlines that have text back functionality now. But most importantly, we've got 1.8 million fans who opted in to hear from us when we launch new stuff. When we shut down that company after a great run of uh, seven-figure uh, revenue and profits for about five years in a row, we've got audio whatever. 
we've got video, whatever. We've got t-shirt, whatever. We've got uh, relationship, whatever. We've got, we're rethinking everything. We're rethinking business card. Look, this presentation sucks. Come visit me this week at ATV, this weekend at ATV. We've got pennywhatever.com. Tons of concepts that involve the pennies. Uh, uh, we're we're going to put one million pennies in a storage locker, and you can sponsor a penny, save a penny, dedicate a penny for uh, just a low price of $1. It's based on some of the viral principles that made some of the... Um, uh, they made the million dollar homepage go. This guy sold a million pixels on a, on a web page. Um, uh, we've got cheap fun, whatever. Lots of products, uh, some of which can be had for a dollar. All of these products, all of these services, all of these charitable campaigns uh, are looking for partners. Confusingstuff.com is a, a kind of a tamer version on... Actually, I'm just going to scroll through some of these because we're basically out of time. So uh, check out our site. Come talk to us. I suck at presenting, but I'm really good at viral. I can make things go viral. We've got stuff that already has viral traction. And I'm looking for managers, operators, executors to help come run this stuff. Foreverminutes.com is launching tonight. For $1, you can own, claim a minute, dedicate it to your grandmother, uh, whatever you want to do. Yeah, we're selling minutes for a dollar. Sounds dumb, but a lot of things sound dumb. The Ice Bucket Challenge sounded dumb, and then it went crazy viral. All right, got to wrap this up. Um, lots of other stuff we're going to click through. and. Oh, random! Everything we're doing has a charitable component to it. Uh, we're going to be raising money for all different kinds of charities with all our stuff. Jobsofkindness.com. We're literally paying people to do charitable things. Freeumbrellas.org. We're going to Okay. Uh, so, yeah, I was not joking. We literally just finished that. I apologize to the first few presenters. I did not see you present because I was literally upstairs doing that audio editing. Uh, yeah, I would hope there's questions because that didn't answer anything. <laughs> yes. Um, good choice of the word madness. Uh, the question was, is there, I was going to do it. Uh, the question is, is there a method to my madness as far as virality goes? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's years of studying it and A-B testing and kind of, I mean, some of it is intuitive, but like the original rejection hotline script, I, uh, I wrote that gender neutral, sexual orientation neutral, race neutral, so everybody thought it applied to them. Uh, the pace was such that you didn't leave pauses for people to zone off. Um, there's, I mean, there's components. So when, when I, back when I was doing more public speaking, uh, like not now, um, I was doing a lot of presentations on viral marketing and there's components to, it, it, it's an art, it's a science, there's psychology involved, there's math involved. Um, on, on a lot of the surface levels, it, a, a lot of people have a skewed perception of virality because 99% of the videos that you see are viral videos. 99% of the apps on your phone are viral apps. You wouldn't have seen them if they were one of the 99.99% of videos that had 27 views or apps that had 14 downloads. Um, so yeah, there's, I mean, it's, it's like uh, somebody who's like really good at graphic design or whatever, like that just happens to be something that I got really good at through um, years of experience. and. As you can see, there's lots of other things that I suck at. So uh, that's, but, but yeah, but that's where I need executors and operators. I need somebody who's going to put together the presentations for all of the things we're launching. Um, but yeah, so that, I don't know if that answered the question. Uh, other questions? I'll ask myself a question. What's the goal of this? Um, <laughs> so. Yeah, so I've literally, so my last company, we kind of shut that down December 31st of 2013. We sold off all the assets um, that we had buyers for, everything we didn't, we bought back. And basically, I've spent the last three years letting my, oh, so, so wait, I take that back. Three years ago this week, I was standing up here pitching a different startup, predictionlog.com, which is still one of the ones we'll launch as part of the Whatever Network. I made the mistake of, I went to a, a startup weekend in San Francisco and pitched that on a whim, and we won startup weekend. And I got all these pats on the back from people who were like, oh, you should come here, and I'll invest in that or whatever. And I was like, okay, that'll be my next startup. And I dove right into it without taking any time off before I, I was suffering from real entrepreneurial burnout. And I dove right into that, didn't take time. And literally was after, the first time I presented it publicly was here at, at Startup Village three years ago. We had... 500 users and 1,000 predictions logged, and it was basically a site where you predict it, log it, prove it, um, have proof that you called it. 
And the next week, like the next few days, I wasn't even checking the site every day to see who had logged a prediction. And I was lo and I had like literally, I almost had a yeah, I had to step back and be like, what are you doing? This isn't what you want to be doing all in. And I kind of realized that I'm I am add.com and I've got a bazillion different ideas. I own 327 different domain names for different concepts. Um, and I even before the humor hotline thing took off, I had about f five to seven things that were reaching millions of people. Uh, are there other questions, or I'll just keep talking? Because <laughs> yes. No, so I'm uh, well. I'm, I'm trying to help in the sense of getting people to think about startups differently, and that not. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, the question was, um, what is the point of starter startups? So, first of all, ad admittedly, I'm not really branding this stuff very well because I've got like 12 different brands for the startup programs. But the goal is to get people thinking about startups differently, and and not. Uh, going by best practices for startups because you've got a couple of entrepreneurs trying to get their pre-MVP launched and then you've got a startup that's 50 employees and 20 million in funding. Those are both startups, but those aren't the same in any regard. There's no best practice that applies to both of those companies. Uh, I want people to start thinking about startups differently and what we are doing is, a, is I mean, because I am the ADD whatever, and, I, and I've got a bazillion different, I realize how much I say whatever now that I started the whatever network. Um, we are providing the, the starter startups. We have traction on some of them, we have marketing channels on some of them, it's all about shared resources, economies of scale, and cross-promotional network effect, and we're putting 100 things out there between now and the end of the year. Sorry. Round of applause. <laughs> Sorry. Sean. There is nobody pitching. All right, so brief little intro while Sean's getting set up here. Um, I know that you guys were expecting to see Access now. Unfortunately, at the very last second, and I do mean the very last second, she had to back out. And Sean O'Brien, um, one of our volunteers, said, I have a presentation ready to go, and I gave it two weeks ago. Do you want to see it? And I said, yes. So he is literally right this second plugging in with no prep time and is going to give us his five-minute pitch. So, first of all, let's give Sean a round of applause for bravery jumping in at the last minute. And theoretically converting his presentation, which works! Hey! hey. I, I gotta do it myself? Yeah, do it. All right, Sean. Wow, this is the, uh, you are up. <laughs> this is the anti-whatever pitch. <laughs> this is about something uh, important, I think, so it's, uh, it's going to take you somewhere different. So we, uh, we're a public benefit corporation, and we want to help two-year college students uh, and make a social impact and, and, by the way, make a lot of money. So there are over, the speaking speak of the, the mic, mic, there are over 10 million community college students in the country, nearly half of all undergraduates. So let's meet, uh, let's meet one of these students. Jane uh, is at lunch. She's with her friends, and she has an idea. I'm going to go back to college, and she wants to share it with them. So she does, and she clicks over to the community college website in her area. In our, in, our, in our state, it might be a technical college. She looks at the registration information, finds out about when her classes will start, and she gets back to her lunch. She's excited. Her friends want to support her. So she goes ahead and enrolls and starts school, and she heads down the road a couple of years and finishes at the community college. What she didn't know when she started was she's going to lose half almost a whole semester, 13 credits, and amass a significant amount of debt. This is for the person, Jane, who actually gets there. Many don't. So she gets to the university that she's going to attend, and when she gets there, and if anybody in the room went through this, I, I'd love to talk to you if you went to a two-year college or a four-year school and you had a, a transfer issue. So after you're there and you're on the, note, uh, you're on the hook for the debt, they're going to send you an email and say, hey, you're actually not a junior. You're a second semester sophomore, and you're going to be in school for an extra six months and owe an extra six or eight thousand dollars. Or, if she goes to one of the community colleges that we partner with, when she's at that lunch with her friends, she's going to get a different experience from the beginning of the time that she gets to the community college's website to the time when she graduates. So first and foremost, we're going to be on the front end of the community college where they struggle. She's going to have a way to ask questions and reach out to an advocate. She's going to be able to digest content that's been built, built specifically for two-year college students. These students aren't getting packages in the mail two, two, and three, and 
four years before they go, go to college or, or in their junior year and they don't have family typically that are helping them. So when she's ready after going through that experience over about a six month period of time, she's gonna go back into our app and she's gonna see what could come. And in this case, she sees that her plan could lead her to lose these credits. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Used to the clicker. Uh, so this is where she sees where she could lose the credits. Before she finishes, she's gonna to get to talk to an advocate who's gonna help her on her plan and help her understand how those credits are gonna uh, transfer into the partner university. And when she gets there, she's gonna graduate on time. She's not gonna lose the semester. She's gonna have a completely different experience. This is impacting millions of students every year. So our job with our, with our marketplace solution is to help her save time and money. It's very simple, the students don't pay anything. Community colleges increase their performance. They struggle to help students graduate. They also receive success funding. They, they really have a no-lose uh, no situation with us, and that's where we've been able to create a lot of demand from partners. And then universities are looking to enroll these students. Universities around, the, you know, around this area even are looking for students in the private space especially. So this turns out to be actually a pretty big market. The marketing space for higher ed, it's kind of a niche thing for people that are in marketing. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a big space. People spend a lot of money on getting students into their, into their universities. So we share tuition revenue with those universities when we help them succeed in enrolling new students. And then we provide the success funding, like I said, to the community colleges. So why affordable college will succeed is because community college and two-year colleges trust us. And as a result, they're sharing access to their students. They're giving us access to the student level data so that we can contact students to seed our marketplace and help students succeed. They're actually co-branding with us and they're promoting our product. So we sit throughout with a trusted brand and we believe that we're gonna be very successful because of it. Uh, we, we produce new data on students in this marketplace. So for marketers in the room, you can imagine if you had a huge flow of students and right now it's a black box you don't get to see into. If you could see into it and understand who those students were, how to build programs, how to market to them, you'd be very interested in that. We also found that universities are actually giving us their community college partners. They're looking to attract these students. They can't get to work with the community colleges, so they give us partnerships. And we didn't expect that, but that's what's happened. We have 11, uh, eight community college partnerships, three university partnerships. When we launched, we got a huge amount of demand from community colleges and from their students. And just to give you an idea, like we're not, this isn't a charity. We're looking to make a lot of money. We think we're going to while we solve the problem. We're gonna help a lot of students. We're gonna generate a lot of revenue. And in the end, reach millions of students across the country with our platform. We have an amazing team, very, very, uh, very experienced. And I'm happy to answer questions about that and the model as well. Thanks. <laughs> Go ahead. I got it. So, do the community college pay? No. The community college students receive the, the service and the product at, for free, and the success funding comes from universities. So, universities pay a lifetime value of about $5,000 per student on the back end and we're able to share some of that revenue with the community colleges and provide resources to the students for free. So that's how we, that's how we subsidize two different stakeholders in the marketplace and build this uh, for community colleges, who by the way, they don't have resources, so people in our industry don't build things for them. So you don't go to the people that don't have the money to build products, which is why they really struggle to come up with new solutions for problems that are systemic like this one. Um, two parents, first generation college student, they live, uh, you know, you they live a the more humble life than they would. Repeat the question. That was the friendly version. <laughs> what got me, why did, why, why did I want to do this? What got me into this? So I, I'm a first generation college student. My parents put a lot of money into it, uh, into my education and, uh, you know, they made sacrifices and I think, um, to me when I, when I came out of, uh, just when I decided to launch something, I was tuned in for me. And then I just I got involved in a bunch of different things around two-year colleges and learned that there's this big space that people aren't doing anything with. Thanks. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My what? My board. The people who are there. Yeah. 
I mean, I think honestly question. that, so the question is, is our board does not represent the people at the community college. How can we? Yeah, so I believe that good technology comes from listening and learning from the people that you're serving. I think that one of the reasons I'm here and that I came here tonight was to recruit new people that care about this. So I'm looking for and open to and want to attract people that have come from different communities that you might not see racially, I think is what you're referencing. Uh, but it doesn't stop us from making great products that solve, solve problems for people. And uh, I'm open to meeting whomever you might know or whom you might suggest that I should connect with. I'm sorry? That'd be, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> well, I'm here for that, so. You know, I'll give you my card. <laughs> why am I not in Georgia? Why am I in upstate New York? So Georgia does not have a two-year college system that's designed for transfer, and they don't actually believe it should. So the technical college system here uh, is tracked for people that want to get into a career and not to take credits with them, and that's what the regents have decided, so it's not the place for us. Uh, but I'm, I'm willing to support that effort, and I've talked to some people about it, if they're, uh, they can solve the politics of actually making that happen. So some of it is, uh, you know, you'd like to think you can why, what was it again? Why, why are we focused on the states we are? We're focused on the states, so why are we focused on the states we're focused on? Um, in higher ed, you have to go out and find people that will work with you, that get it. So the, the president that I met up in New York said, why wouldn't we do this to her team? And they started doing it with us. So it turns out that not everybody thinks like that in higher ed. And uh, we found a group there that has a lot of trust together. They're a very effective partners for us. They're passionate about what we're doing and we decided we're going to go there with them because they would work with us. And then in the end, New York is very fragmented, so it's actually a good place for a new marketplace solution. But we didn't really know that. We just knew she said, why wouldn't we do this? I said, that's her. That's the one. <laughs> That's a great question. We're focused on the core. So the question is, why, what else are we doing besides focused on the core credits? So the core credits turned out to be, turns out to be a huge value. We're really focused on that core use case. And there are a ton of other things in addition to the content. So the content is the big piece and then the credits. But if you look at the, the value, the underlying value of what we do, it's really the credits. So thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. Thanks, Allie, for having me up. Appreciate it. Great last minute job there. Um, so thank you all so much for coming out tonight. We appreciate it. We do meet the last Monday of every month. We have a meetup group with like 10,000 members. So join the meetup group. Put on the post what you are looking for and who you're looking for and somebody will be out there. Catch your volunteers in the back and the presenters up front. Thanks so much for coming out tonight, guys.